It's ad break time. I'm proud to announce that Beyond Solitaire podcast is sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. And as usual, they're up to some amazing things. Their next game, Hydrologic Cycle, is scheduled to come to Kickstarter on March 26th. CLGS also continues to offer classes in partnership with Gen Con. The next course, Jason Fury's Crowdfunding with Confidence, starts May 6th and will teach you all about board games and crowdfunding. Go check it out. Also, I'll include a final plug for myself. If you like the show and want to support it, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash beyond solitaire. Thanks to listeners like you, I've been able to keep upgrading my equipment, subscribing to StreamYard, and more. But for now, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire. And this week on the pod, I am here with a very special guest. Uh, this is Dr. Jane Draycott. She's a lecturer in ancient history at the University of Glasgow. How are you doing, Jane? Hi, I'm all right. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm super excited to talk to you. Um, so for those of you out there who do not know who Jane Draycott is, you should. Um, but <laughs> you she should. is you definitely should. <laughs> absolutely. She's an expert on women in video games about the ancient world, uh, as well as on Cleopatra's daughter, which we might also get to at some point in this discussion. Um, so uh, Jane, the reason I invited you on the podcast was because you edited a volume recently called Women in Historical and Archaeological Video Games. So uh, for the curious, could you tell us a bit about that volume and how it came together? Oh, let me think. Right. Well, it's it's actually it's part of a much bigger project. So um, I originally I had actually been asked to review an edited volume on uh, classical video games and I had said yes because you know I, I play video games I enjoy video games and I also spend a lot of my time doing classics and ancient history so I thought yeah bring bring those things together so I read the book and I reviewed the book and one of the things that I noted in my review was that of the 17 or so contributors to the volume there were only two women um, there was only one chapter that by, by one of these women that, that looked at women in video games and the other um, female contributor was part of a group looking at something else. And so I noted in, in my uh, review that this is rather um, unequal coverage, really, and that, that potentially that there, there, there should have been some consideration as, as to, you know, is, is this something that... We, we should maybe solicit some more contributors or we should think about the coverage or whatever. Because of course, when you're doing an edited volume, it never works out exactly as you, as you plan. People drop out or, or whatever. And sometimes people point stuff out to you later and you're like, oh my God, that was so obvious. I can't believe I didn't think of that. But at the time you were just, you know, you were in it and you didn't think. So I wrote this in my review and then I was contacted by the editor of the series. Um, the book was published by Bloomsbury. So I was contacted by the editor um, to say, well, <laughs> maybe you'd like to, I'm probably not, not in that, it was an email. So, you know, probably not quite that tone, but, but it was, it was basically a case of, you know, you, you said this and now we, we want you to put your money where your mouth is and do something about it. And so I thought, yeah, okay, why not? Um, it fair's fair. And at the same time, um, I'm very good friends with Dr. Kate Cook who is at St. Andrews, who also is a very keen uh, gamer, as well as being a very keen classicist. And we were, and this, this makes my life sound a bit more glamorous than it actually is, but we were in Paris. We, we were on a sort of girls weekend in Paris and we were just sort of wandering around the city, you know, being all, well, pretending to be sophisticated. And we were talking about video games as we were walking past, you know, the, the, the Pantheon, the, the Eiffel Tower and all that kind of thing. And so I told her about this and she was like, oh, well, that sounds really interesting. And we, and we just started talking and brainstorming and we decided to do it together. And I swear, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm this, I, t I did say it was a long story, but I am going to get to the, the kind of ultimate part of it, I suppose. So this was in December of 2019. And so early 2020, we, you know, after after Christmas had, had come and gone and we, we'd sort of talked about this a bit more, we were like, right, well, how should we do this? Um, let's, we can, we can put together a call for papers. We can ask for, for people to, to submit papers on women in, in, 
in historical and archaeological and, and classical video games. And then COVID happened and um, everybody went into lockdown, was, was stuck at home. And in the end, we, we didn't have a conference or anything like that. We, we put out the call for papers and we got something like 50, uh, 50 abstracts from people. And we sort of thought, well, what, what do we do? How, how, do we, how do we choose? How do we, how do we narrow this down to sort of 15 or thereabouts papers from 50? And so we thought, well, let's do two books instead of one. <laughs> let's, let's do a book that's about um, specifically classics and a book that's about just historical and archaeological. Um, and so conveniently enough, the, the, um, the abstracts that we have, the 50 or so abstracts, they split quite nicely into these two different, different areas. And so, um, yeah, we decided to do that. Um, Kate and I edited women in classical video games for Bloomsbury and I edited women in historical and archaeological games for De Bruyter and their um, video games in the humanities series and so yeah we, we ended up with with two really fantastic edited volumes all about women in in different sorts of, of uh, historical archaeological classical video games and it's kind of it's, it seems to be the most interesting work I've ever done as far as other people are concerned. I get so many questions and, and sort of uh, comments from people who've, who've read the books, um, who, who want me to do podcasts or want me to do conference papers or panels or things like that. And so it's really, for something that was a kind of fun little side project during lockdown, it's kind of taken over my life and now it seems to be the the research area that that is the most sort of dynamic um as as far as well the world is concerned really and so many so many scholars are starting to see the potential of video games for for history and for archaeology and and just video games generally and so this is this is something that I'm I'm now spending a, a bit of time wondering do do I want to make this more of a, a, a sort of formal thing that I spend my time on rather than the sort of the side, the fun side project that I do. Haven't decided awesome. yet. <laughs> yeah. So this leads me to the question, you know, I've, I feel like when I, so I finished my PhD in 2014 it was my like graduation year and I was in an, a religious studies program, but I do not feel like video games were a hot thing at the time. And if they had been, I don't know that my life would have taken the same course. <laughs> so is this a recent thing? Is this something that I missed? Like, how would you say that the attention to video games uh, from classes has changed over the course of your of your career to date? I think it's 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 very it's really interesting to think about that. And I do have some ideas. I, I don't know. Uh, these are just my own personal ideas. They no, no proof. It's just just assumptions. Um, partly, I think it's age because I'm in my early forties, and I think if for, for classicists who are working on video games at all, they are in their mid forties or younger. Um, there are lots and lots of early career. PhD, ECR people now who are doing serious research on video games. But as far as going sort of up from that, I think it tends to be people in their mid 40s and it tends to be side projects um, in, you know, that they, they do for, they started doing for fun, um, but very much sort of subordinate to their, their proper classics research area. And I've got I've got colleagues who are older than me who've never played a video game. So, I, so I, it is partly it is a generational thing. So I, I think it is people people growing up in the sort of the late seventies, eighties. Those were the children that had access to video games, and then grew up playing them and, and sort of graduated from the sort of you know, the Sega Mega Drive type stuff to the the now the Xbox, the PlayStation, and so. That's part of it, that simply pe people in their 50s and 60s, especially in, in sort of classics departments, they just never played them. And maybe maybe their kids played them, but they, they never necessarily thought of them as something that was scholarly. And I, I can completely 
sympathize with that because I was, I started university in 2001 and classical reception was not a thing, you know? Um, I mean, I, presumably people were at that time, you know, they were, Troy came out, Gladiator came out. So, so people were definitely interested in, oh, here's a movie that's about the ancient world or here are Lindsay Davis and David, here are Lindsay Davis's Falco novels and, and Stephen Saylor's novels and things like that. But it was more just a kind of fun thing that your your academic interest, you, you could read these things or watch these things and, and your academic interest would be there and you, know, you could get the jokes and stuff. But to do that as academic work, I, I think was not really a thing back then. And I think it's really only in the last sort of maybe 10, 15 years, because even when people started doing research on classical reception, there was a lot of snobbery. Oh, that's not proper classics. That's media studies. That's film studies. That's what you do if you're not actually, you know, you're, you're interested in classics, but you don't have the classical education or whatever. So there was a lot of snobbery about it. And then with video games, there's a lot of snobbery just generally about video games, you know, ruining our youth and all that kind of thing. And so I, th I think that's partly why it's only really in the last sort of 10 to 15 years that people have started paying attention to classical reception and, and generally and then video games as part of that. Also, I think it's it's sort of a kind of depressing result of capitalism because video games make money. And so because they've started making money, well, yeah, they make they make billions, billions of dollars, billions of pounds. They're the, the highest grossing form of entertainment. They make more money than the movies they make more money than music so this idea that oh well they make money therefore they must be intrinsically um, valuable and it, they're, they're worth spending your time on and they're worth spending your your scholarly attention on and then aside from those depressing things there is i think the pandemic um people people were at home and they needed to have entertainment they needed to be able to escape from the sort of small confines of their their house or their flat or whatever and and video games uh, allow them to do that and I think a big a big factor in that was uh, the Assassin's Creed uh, franchise and the the game's origins and Odyssey because obviously people have played this, this sort of strategy stuff like Total War those sorts of things for a long time people played God of War for a long time but I think the Assassin's Creed games with their recreations of Hellenistic Egypt and classical Greece that kind of caught people's eyes, classicists' eyes, even those that hadn't always played video games, they thought, oh, this is really interesting. I can I can play this and I can run around in ancient Greece or ancient Egypt, the place that has taken up so much of my time and my energy. Now I can do this. I can maybe, I can do it for fun. I can use it for teaching. Um, and then that, of course, snowballs from there because so many more classical games have come out in the last few years as well that have been really interesting and really accessible. So it's a, it's a whole, whole many-stepped process, I think, not one sort of single individual thing. Oh, no, that's really interesting. And you mentioned, you know, a lot of classical video games coming out. Like, when we talk about classical video games, what kinds of gaming experiences fall into that range? Because it's not just Assassin's Creed. No, I mean, they're, they're, this, this, is, this is something that people, I suppose, should bear in mind, because... I guess your first your first instinct is to go looking for the very sort of historical ones. So I mentioned the games like Total War, the sort of strategy games, and those have been around for a long time. The idea of having sort of being able to redo the military campaigns of, of Caesar and Alexander and, and other people um, and very kind of uh, Roman army sort of focused um, people. So there's, there's that side of it. There's the historical side of it. Uh, there is the RPG side of it. So things like, I mean, people can play Assassin's Creed for, you know, the assassination, but at the same time, you could play it for the RPG and you can kind of just ignore the assassination and just run around um, the world collecting things and seeing things and doing photo mode and things like that. Um, then you've got the sort of mythological ones. I mean, this is, this is where classics actually, it's, I guess... It's quite common. You've either got the very, the very sort of strategic military focused Roman stuff, or you have the Greek mythological stuff. And and you know, but then I think as time's gone on, game developers have just got they've got more creative as well. They they they're doing more, they they're doing more things in relation to 
ancient history, archaeology, mythology. Um, but they're also that you know, there are more more genres, and, and um, then you've got independent games as well. And and you know they're, they're, they sort of do all kinds of interesting things that have nothing much in common with the AAA games. So when you are researching classical games. I'm going to have two questions about it, but the first one is just how do you do it? Like it's, how do you cite a video game? How much of it do you have to play in order to really get a sense? Do you just watch let's plays? Like how is that labor done? And then how is it recorded for integration into academic work? Right. Well, I, I probably have a, a different answer to this than, than other people. Like, like uh, I mentioned Kate Cook, for example. So I am a very selective gamer. I only like certain kinds of video games and therefore I only play certain kinds of video games. I mean, I'm, I'm prepared to try things, you know, um, because I, if, if the story sounds like it's going to be interesting or something, but I, I like RPGs. Um, I also like, I suppose, little sort of indie games as well, but I, I don't like first person shooters. I don't like games that are too combat heavy. I don't like PC games strategy games those sorts of things so so to, for, for me I will choose a game based on firstly do I actually want to play this and if the answer is no I, I do not want to play this I, I you know I, I don't play PC games I play console games um, and so if something's only available on PC I'm not going to play it as, as, as interesting as it might sound um, I'm, I'm just not going to play it and if it's not the kind of game that I enjoy, I'm not going to play it. Doesn't matter how relevant it might be to my research, just it's not going to happen. So there is that. Whereas Kate, for example, she she plays everything, <laughs> so you know, um, or perhaps not everything, but but she she goes into it sort of for for the classics. Um, whereas I guess I go into it for the video games, um, and if 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 there are classics there, then that's a bonus. Um, as far as yeah, obviously YouTube and, and and streams of people playing games. I mean, I, I've been using one of those recently. I, I I'm writing. I'm currently writing a paper on the Forgotten City. Um, oh, I which... love that was a really interesting experience. Yes, continue. See, <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate that game, <laughs> or at least I I don't. I I love I love Skyrim. I I love Oblivion and Skyrim and, and the Elder Scrolls games. And so the idea that there was a mod for that was originally grew out of the Elder Scrolls games and, and then became a, a sort of Roman history uh, game. I, I was thrilled about that. And I played it on the Switch because that was that was what I had available to me at the time. And it is awful to play on the Switch. It is so sluggish and buggy and just there's no finesse to it at all. And I I tapped out after a couple of hours i was just like i well, cannot sit here and play this i'm kind of glad for you on that though because you mentioned you don't like shooters well i mean you do love skyrim so it's okay but like i was so mad that forgotten city started out as this kind of low pressure exploration game and then yeah. suddenly there was combat part way through well this this is the <sighs> thing and so so because i'm because i'm writing a, a paper about this game about an aspect of this game which i haven't actually reached i haven't reached that part of the game because i came up on the game and so uh well no to, to be fair i was right I'm, I'm writing two things and one of the things that i'm writing I, I i have played the part of the game that is relevant to it but then there's this other part of the game i have not got to the game and i'm and i am in a bit of a moral dilemma i'm like can i bear to sit down and force my way through this game um to get to the bit that i need to get to and well uh i i have i have i probably I, I don't have the time i do not have the time to to spend hours and hours playing a game that is a horrible experience to play and and so i have watched um the the, the walkthroughs the parts of the game um on youtube so i've watched a couple of different people's playthroughs to to kind of get the the uh the sort of information and the um you know I've, I've taken screenshots of the text and, and and things like that so that i have the actual i mean and this is what i would do if i were playing it myself i would i would take photos of of it and i would then you know use those to sort of get the text and, and get the images and things and i spoiled myself silly online reading um about all the different endings and, and 
in some respects, I am glad that I did not suffer through the rest of that game because I would have been enraged <laughs> if I got all the way to the end. And that was, I'm not going to spoil it for anybody who's, who's uh, uh, watching or listening and, and, and hasn't hasn't finished the game. But I, I yeah. I, I would have I would have been so angry and disappointed and I would have felt so betrayed. <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> so that that is is how you how you how you do it or, or don't do it. Um and then you sort of once you know you, you play the game or you know you 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 watch other people playing the game, I you do research um on you know you, you look for interviews with the developers um that that can be that can be that can be great stuff online um if you can find some good good interviews with developers that go into the process i mean the bigger triple a studios they they sometimes do documentaries so i just watched the uh, naughty dog uh, grounded part two um documentary that's amazing and it's a fantastic insight into everything that they're doing um some some studios have a lot more information available to them than others um, big studios don't tend to get back to you if you email them, which is, is a, I think they're missing a trick there, to be perfectly honest. Um, smaller studios can do, and then I've, I've actually, um, my, my chapter in the Historical and Archaeological Video Games um, book was about a game called Heaven's Vault, by, made by a company called Inkle. And I basically, I, I think initially I slid into John Ingold's DMs possibly he's he's the he's the creative director of that company either i slid into his dms and said you know hi john i'm a big fan of your work you know um would would you be open to sort of discussing the game with me yeah can i email you um or um i, I can't quite remember because it was a few years ago now or or I, or I sort of emailed him basically saying the same thing that you know um i'm i'm really big fan of this game i'm, I'm writing about this game um would you be open to answering some questions and so then we sort of had a back and forth email exchange and you know he gave me um permission to use photos in the in the book and on the cover as well and and so so that's another way of doing it you know you actually get to talk to the developers and then of course people do publish articles scholarly articles um obviously there are more about older games than there are about newer games um but you can read those and also fun delving into the discussion forums online get all sorts of interesting insights into gaming from there so you you basically you you would research it in much the same way i think as as you you would research anything else you you start off casting your net wide trying to do lots of different things trying to get lots of different insights and then you you find the stuff that's really interesting and, and what is relevant to what you're trying to do so for my chapter talking to john ingold and, and sort of asking him questions about what he what he had chosen to do that was what I was doing with that chapter. I wanted to know what was going on behind the scenes of that game. Whereas another contributor in that volume, he used the, his chapter was about the players and their, their thoughts on the game. So he used a lot of material from the forums about the, the games that he, he was interested in. And, and so, you know, you, you just sort of, you start off quite wide and then you gradually narrow your focus until you get the information that you need. Yeah, and I, I, I also wonder, so one, one of the reasons for this set of questioning is that I recently interviewed Henry Lowood, who will have been on an earlier episode this season. Uh, and, you know, he runs the, the archives at Stanford. But um, one thing that also I'm fascinated by is, you know, links go dead, games go offline, especially now that we stream more and more of the games we play. Uh, maybe somebody makes that YouTube video private that you used for your initial, um, your initial walkthroughs. What um, what can you do in academic work to kind of preserve the citation so that it's still useful, even if something happens to the original source, to the original link, to even maybe the game itself? Well, I think in some sometimes you just can't. I mean, and, and that that is true not just for video games, but I mean, if you think about if a if a book goes out of print and um, there are no copies of it to be had. You, you can't cite that book, you know, if, if a journal, if, if a journal is online only, and then suddenly, you know, that that disappears, you, you can't cite that. And so with with video games, sometimes the links can be, um, you know, sort of permanent links, and that's helpful. Uh, other times, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose when something is published, it is something of a snapshot in time. And so the information in, in the publication is the information that you had at that time. And so the the references are what was available at the time. So um, if, if you then go back to them later and, you know, they this, this is one of the things when, when you're when you're doing this sort of final preparation for something to be published, you do check all the links to make sure that the 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 one that was used a year or two or however many years when whenever the person originally used them, you, you do check them to make sure that they're still valid. And then you, you update you know, the, the date accessed so that people know that. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's only so much you can do about that. It is frustrating. I mean, a lot of games are not available anymore. One of one of the 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 um, the thing that I was using the Forgotten City for that that um, the first thing. Um, well, I guess what I what I was doing for that I was I was um, working on the depiction of medicine in in ancient or historical video games, and so I was looking at different types of games and the different ways that medicine is used in them, and. Uh, so for that section, uh, I was writing about educational games and the, and the ways that um, m you can make educational medical games. And there's a whole bunch of, of medical history games that are about uh, outbreaks of plague or, or outbreaks of, of um, cholera and things like that. And there were a bunch that were made by university departments with with either, either by the academics or, or by the students um, with sort of funding um so you know these decent games that had at one time been available online for people to play as as educational games they were all in flash so as of about what two years ago yeah the flash gone dead so all of these games the websites for these games still exist and they still have the download the game here links games don't exist anymore and I had, you know, I had to put this in my article. <laughs> Unfortunately, you, you can't play these games anymore. I, I'm sure they would have been great, but you can't play them. Um, and it is, it is something that I think uh, we we do perhaps need to reckon with. And um, Andrew Reinhardt uh, has has done work on. Um, well, he he sort of founded Archeo Gaming, I suppose, as as a sort of research area. And my the work that I do in Archeo Gaming is is looking at the way that archaeology is depicted in video games and that's that's one of the things that he does too but another thing that he does under the sort of umbrella of archaeo gaming is he looks at the archaeology of video games themselves and that's both the sort of the physical archaeology like like digging up the atari deposit um that he did a few years ago but it's also like the digital archaeology of video games like how can you access how can you preserve these things that never really tangibly existed they and yeah, I mean, it, it actually, it does suit a lot of people that these things go, well, they, they, they cease to exist. I mean, it's the same thing with um, physical media, you know, films and TV series. Um, it's very much in the, in the news at the moment about films being, uh, well, never released, deleted, um, no one ever having access to them again so that, that movie studios can get sort of, financial benefits out of that and so in in some respects even the companies that are making this media do not necessarily want it to continue to be available so we do have to we do have to think about that I mean I think perhaps it sounds a bit defeatist but you can only do your best you can only do what you can do and um you know if if, if something that you you were working on no longer exists I suppose you you can try I mean I, I just, I tend to assume that YouTube is there forever and of course it's not, but, but I mean, I think if, if you, if you've lost one particular playthrough, there'll still be lots more because it's, it's not just one person playing a video game. It's, it's many people and uh, you, you can find um, these things if you go looking for them. So kind of leading on to that, how, so you mentioned that you really focus on games that you actually want to play, which is very fair. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about the ephemeral nature of these games. Also fair. How does that, uh, there are a lot of games now with kind of mythological or classical references. There are mobile games. There are, you know, it's the whole, the world is our oyster, but also how do you make choices about which games you give the scholarly treatment 
given that you don't, I mean, it's, I, of course, part of it will be preference. Part of it will be just what you've heard of. But also, you know, especially because so, so much of your work is about representation and kind of finding different narratives. How does that play out in terms of the games that you choose to give your attention to? That is a really... It's a really opportune question to ask, actually, <laughs> because I I mentioned uh, the Assassin's Creed franchise earlier, and I I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours playing Origins and Odyssey and even Valhalla. I mean, it, it wasn't. I, I'm not in any way a sort of um, Anglo-Saxon Viking scholar, but the fact that they were running around in in the ruins of of um, Roma Britain, that, well, that was partly why I played that. However, I will no longer play Ubisoft games. I will no longer give them my time. I will no longer give them my money. And I will no longer give them my scholarly attention. I mean, I'm obviously I'm talking about them now, <laughs> but, but you know, I, um, I, I will not um, devote any more of my very limited uh, free time to that company. And I, I do, do I do I need to explain why? I mean, is this is this something you think that so that uh, people will not be aware of, or, or uh... Uh, maybe the TLDR version? And, and this this is actually um, it is not it is not just Ubisoft that has this problem. There are there are other video games companies, um, video game development studios that are exactly the same when it comes to the way that they treat their staff, the the way they treat their their female and non-binary and um, LGBTQ and um, people of color staff until these, these companies do better and start treating their staff better and actually start making their games more representative and respectful. Um, I'm, I'm not prepared to, to uh, give, them, give them anything, time, money, um, respectability even i mean that, that's the thing by by devoting academic attention to video games you are making a statement that these these have more to them than you know some people might think and and um more credibility i don't i don't uh, i i don't want to do that so yeah i mean the, the the sort of the more positive version of that i suppose is that i do have i have very limited free time just you know, with with my my job and my family and and modern life being the way it is, so I do have to be very very selective anyway. Even if I wasn't naturally a very selective gamer, I would still have to be quite selective in well, what platform is this available on? I I as I said, I don't play PC games. I mean, I have a laptop, I have I have a PC, but I don't play games on them because I spend enough time sitting in front of my computer. I don't want to spend my evenings or weekends doing that. So. I will play games on, um, I have a PlayStation, uh, I have a Nintendo Switch, and I do have an Xbox, but I haven't played that for a long time. I say I, say I. my partner has all of these things, <laughs> so he's, he's, a, he's a video game programmer, he works for um, a, a, a games company, actually. Um, so yeah, between the two of us, we, we, have, we have quite a, a range of, of consoles and quite a range of games, because we like very different games. So the sort of the practicalities of it dictate which which ones in the first instance I might be inclined to spend time on. And then my my own inclinations dictate even further. And yeah, it is. I I would never say that it's a bad thing that there are there are so many choices for people who are interested in, you know, the classical world in video games in the same way that I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that there are so many Greek feminist retelling novels available in bookshops. But you can't read them all. You can't play them all. You do have to make some kind of choice. And I've I've stopped reading the, the Greek feminist myth retellings because they're all pretty much the same. I've I've, <laughs> I've read about the Trojan War. I, there, there's nothing sufficiently different about the ones that are coming out now than there were about the ones coming out a couple of years ago. So I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend my time on that. And the, the same with video games, really. If it's if it's not a genre that I enjoy. So, like I said, I combat and no, thank you. Um, then I'm I'm not going to play it, which makes things a bit easier because a, a lot of games are very combat heavy. So if you, you, you sort of remove those from the equation, it makes it easier. I don't play mobile games either, so that, that also 
makes makes that you know the, I don't have to engage with with that side of things. And I think, I mean, you you could argue that if you're going to be a sort of scholar working on video games, you must play everything because how can you have any uh, any real insight if you don't play everything? But I think people have been making those arguments about books as well. You must read everything. How will you have any scholarly insight if you haven't read this obscure Russian only, um, you know, version of this text? And I think, well, mm, <laughs> just not but like, do, do you that. really have to? <laughs> exactly. A part, part of being part of being a scholar, actually, part of finishing work and and getting it published is knowing when to stop. Because if, if you if you decide that you need to wait until you've read these things and you read those things and then a bunch more things get published and like, oh, well, I, now I've got to read those too. And, you know, and it just you push it back and push it back and push it back. And I think you do have to say, no, that 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 is that is it. I um, if new stuff gets published and it makes me change my thoughts. I'll write something else about that, but I'm, I can't incorporate that into this. And because scholarship takes a really long time anyway, I mean, you know, minimum amount of time, I think you can, you can get stuff published in. Our, our two edited volumes for the video games, because we didn't have to have a conference, because we, we got the abstracts and then we got the chapters immediately in the summer of uh, 2020 when everybody was in lockdown, those two books came out in 2022. So it was two years from from sort of beginning to to the end of the process, and we wanted it we wanted it to be fast because we knew that there were going to be more games coming out and there were going to be DLCs and the, there would there would be some of the scholarship would have been superseded etc. So so we knew we 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 had a very tight turnaround for that, and that's I think the way you've got to approach it is that you know you you, you need to you do it and then you finish it and then it's out. And then, yeah, you can come back to it later and, and add to it if you, if you like. But you, you just have to set your limits fairly early on. Otherwise, you will never finish anything. And uh, every, you'll just <laughs> never have any satisfaction whatsoever. <laughs> hey, you can you can just start um, doing edit volume expansions and just pitch them that way. Well, exactly. I mean, this this is this is one one of the ways to look at it, I suppose, is that you you can um, you can do uh, and if you if you if you publish well if you have your own website and your own blog, you can you can do it as as quickly as you like. Um, if you're if you're publishing in like online journals or something, it'll probably take a little bit longer. But absolutely, you know, you you can um, publish you know part two of of whatever work you were doing and. Uh, yeah, look at it. Look at it as DLC. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna we're gonna come back to this, but first, I, I do want to talk. So you mentioned that this started as a side project for you when you started on the classics path. What did you think your main research area was, and do you still feel that way? Well, when when it's 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 hard to know really because my my classics path has been fairly windy. I mean, I, I started off my my undergraduate degree was in ancient history and archaeology, and then my master's degrees I have one in ancient history and I have one in forensic archaeology and anthropology. And the reason I did those was because I gradually became interested in. Well, I was always interested in people. I was interested in ordinary people, which is why I, I did archaeology as an undergraduate and then continued as a, as a postgraduate. I wanted to know about people and what better way to find out about them than looking at their bones and, and other things. And Don't I became really in <laughs> 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 I became really interested in medicine, um, the history of medicine and the archaeology of medicine. And that that is my my main my sort of first research interest really is i i am a historian of medicine archaeologist of medicine there's no there's no sort of um quick kind of uh, succinct way to say it really um so my phd i did my phd in classics entirely accidentally it was simply that my local university uh, i applied to, well i approached three different universities that i could get to from where i was living at the time and one of them just ignored my email completely. Um, one of them emailed me back, but they were really quite obnoxious. And I was like, mm, okay, I don't really, you know, this is not, this is not good. And then the third one, 
um, the, the person that emailed me back um, was, was really nice and really encouraging. And he went on to actually um, be my PhD supervisor. Um, and so, so I had a PhD in classics, not because I was a classicist, but because that was what they offered. They didn't have a PhD in ancient history or, or you know, any, any other sort of qualification. So I have a PhD in classics whilst not really considering myself to be a classicist. And so I, for the last 10, 12 years, 13, 13 years since I got my PhD, because um, obviously we, we have now just changed the changed year, um, I, I have been a medical historian and that, that's kind of expanded a little bit to, to look at, it's not just medicine, but it's, it's disability as well. And a little bit of sort of science and technology in relation to those things. So that is what's, I guess, comes out on my CV the, the most. And that is what is what is in my author bio and my, my research bio on, on my university website and things like that. So that's my number one research area. But I am at a point where I've finished off actually a lot of a lot of projects. I, I finished my my most recent book. Um, like my monograph, which was prosthetics and assistive technology in ancient Greece and Rome. And I actually do sort of feel like maybe I've said all I really want to say about medicine and about disability um, in antiquity. I, I don't think I, I have any, any new insights right now. I, and I, I don't know if that's a sort of permanent condition or it's just a temporary one. Um, but I have been looking at other things. I have been I have been looking at um, well, I've been doing some some trade writing, um, popular history writing, and so I've been I've been looking more at women's history for that. And of course, the video games. Um, the video games was not necessarily something that I saw myself doing long term, but because it's been the thing that people seem to be the most interested in, and it's the thing that seems to be the most sort of dynamic at the moment um, as far as people working on it, organizations being set up to, to work on it. And so I, I am thinking, well, do, do I want to make this my main research area? And I'm still actually, I'm not really decided because as I said, I'm, I'm very selective about the games that I play. And I don't know if that necessarily does lend itself to working on this full time. I think I might have to expand my remit a bit more, but then I think, well, would that spoil gaming for me? If, if I may, I mean, my, my partner, who, who is a, a video game programmer, <laughs> he, he's uh, working working um, for a games company. And, and um, people people always think, um, he, he says anyway, and they always think it's such a cool job, you know? Oh, wow, you, you, get to, you get to play video games all day. And he's like, no, no, I don't. I hardly ever get to play video games. And, and in fact, he's, he's only recently started playing video games again just because of, you know, having not having had the time and not having had the energy after like a full day's work of programming so there is that danger that if you do what you love full time e well either you you burn out because you just can't stop doing it or you stop loving it and then you sort of think oh how can i how can i find my love again i mean isn't that just the, the full academic curse though <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I also want to bring up um, you speaking of your interest in women's history. Uh, you also had a, a work of popular history come out in the past year. It was last year. It came out. Yeah, it came out in hardback at the end of 2022 in the UK. And then in hardback in the US in spring, summer of 2023. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's sort of st that staggered release over the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, but you wrote Cleopatra's Daughter. So do you mm -hmm. want to kind of tell people about that one really quick, just for, for fun, like, you know, how that yeah. connects to any other research you're doing? Well, it, it, that's the thing. It, it does, actually, because um, I did my PhD was on um, medicine and, and related issues in Greco-Rome in Egypt. And so when I was doing my PhD, my, my sort of main focus was obviously on, on the sort of the medicine, the health, et cetera. But my side project was um, Cleopatra, Cleopatra Cellini. And uh, yeah, that just after after I finished my PhD and, you know, I was I continue. I've always felt that it's good to have a side project because when you get really sick and tired of your main project or even when you've just you've reached a point with your main project that you can't go any further with it because you're waiting for something or someone. It's good to have a side project because then you can go off and do that for a little while and then you can 
um, come back sort of mentally refreshed and you know, your enthusiasm is, is sort of re- refilled. And so my, my side project during my PhD in sort of the early years of my academic career was uh, Cleopatra Cellini and things to do with her. And I wrote a short article for History Today back in 2013. Um, that, that was the, the at, at that time I had thought, oh, she, I could I could write a biography of her. I could write a popular history book of her. But I sent a proposal to loads of agents and nobody was interested. And so I wrote I used the research I had and I wrote an article for History Today because, you know, they paid and I needed some money because I was a, a poor early career researcher. And then that uh, article, as, as we were talking about earlier, actually, that article, it was published in the paper version periodically it would appear online because history today sometimes pull out articles from their archives and they make them available online for people to read so that was originally published in 2013 and then in 2018 it was it was pulled from the archive and it was it was made available online and someone read it and this this someone was a new literary agent and and he said well, he emailed me and he was like, I've, I've read your article and, and I was, I was, I think it's really interesting. I think it'd make a really good book. And I was like, well, <laughs> little do you know that, you know, sort of six years ago, I thought exactly the same thing. Um, and nobody, nobody else did, but clearly, you know, things have changed now. And, and so that, that was, that was how that happened. I, um, I, I did, I developed the article into a book. It is a, a popular history um, historical biography of Cleopatra Cellini, the only daughter of Cleopatra the Seventh and Mark Antony, and it's about her very interesting life as as separate from her parents because uh, she was able to basically succeed where they failed and and do the things that they wanted to do. She was she was able to uh, survive um, for starters, but she was also able to become queen of a of a very significant. African, North African um, Roman client kingdom. And she was able to rule alongside her husband and um, have a very sort of interesting life that was full of sort of ups and downs, you know, going from uh, the the subtitle in the UK version is um, Egyptian princess, Roman prisoner, African queen. Um, In the American version, it's, it's, what is it from, from Roman prisoner to African queen or something like that, or I think that's right. Yeah, they thought they thought the subtitle was a bit too long, but but I think I the like that. Is, I like the UK subtitle personally. Yeah, because it, it basically says you know she's she has a life as an Egyptian princess, and that's that's very sort of luxurious and and um, prestigious and exciting. Then she's a Roman prisoner, and that's quite grim because you know her parents are dead and her brothers are dead and her future is dead, <laughs> and she becomes an African queen, and it it all comes back again. Um, so very you know ups and downs, the wheel of fortune, that kind of thing. So. Um, I thought that she had a very interesting life story. People didn't really know about it. Um, people know about Anthony and Cleopatra. They don't really know much else um, beyond that. And yes, I, I wrote that book. That book is is out. Um, it's it's in bookshops. That, that's the other thing, of course. You know, you you write academic books. They don't tend to end up in bookshops. They they go on the shelves in academic libraries, and every couple of years, somebody will like take them off the shelf, blow off the dust, and maybe maybe use them. Whereas I I really did want to have a book that was on a nice pile in a bookshop that you know random people would would come across and, and think, oh that looks interesting, and, and buy and then read. So that's been quite gratifying. Yeah, and it's also I feel like that's also something that's somewhat new for um, academics to have a component of their lives and careers where they get a literary agent and they publish popular history. You know, Helen Fry, it's like, a she's a World War II intelligence historian, has also started doing that. And I've been a big fan of her stuff. But, you know, I I feel like um, it's really, really cool to see more, I guess, pop academic work. But I also feel like that's new. Is that a misperception? Or do you think that that is a new development in academia? And... How do you think that that is related, if at all, to things like also openness to engaging with pop culture and with video games and with reception stuff? Um, hmm. I think, I think academics, there have always been academics on TV um, doing sort of documentaries and and I guess on the radio and things like that. but I suppose not necessarily that many of them. And 
I, as far as as far as classics and ancient history on TV is concerned, I think um, we have Bethany Hughes to thank for that, really. Um, back in the what, mid mid to late nineties, Bethany Hughes's documentaries, and she she started and she she wrote uh, she did a documentary on Helen of Troy and she did a book that went along with that um, documentary. And I love that book actually. That's a that is one of my favourite popular history, popular classics books because it 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 pretty much did everything that I ever wanted to do in in that respect. It was it was. It was worth reading, you know. It was not so so sort of shallow and superficial as to simply be just like a summary of events. Because some popular history books are, you know, they're, they're just narrative histories. This happens. This happens. This happens. And some of them they 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 don't they don't tell you anything new because the author hasn't done any actual research. You know, not not everybody who writes a book about the six wives of Henry VIII is actually doing research, you know, they, they, quite a few of them are simply just using what's already out there and sort of repackaging it in, in a, in a, in a sort of pacey kind of way. And so, yeah, I think Bethany Hughes started it and then that sort of cracked the door open to people like Michael Scott, um, Mary Beard as well. It was this, this, um, you know, there was proof that people were interested in watching documentaries about ancient history. And the same thing with books, I suppose, is, is that Tom Holland um, has been writing Roman history, Roman history adjacent books for 20 years. Um, Adrian Goldsworthy, you know, there, there, are, there are plenty of people who have been writing um, popular history books. But I think perhaps what's new is the sort of the diversity. Not, well, maybe not, di- diversity is not necessarily the word, but it's there is a there's more of an openness to things that are not simply you know year by year and not right. simply great not just another man bio life. Of, exactly <laughs> yeah so so you know that that's people people want to read a you know <clears throat> yeah they, they may want to read another biography of julius caesar um but at the same time they they also may want to read um other things about ancient rome and I guess publishers realized that and decided that it was worth doing because it would make them money. So they, they were more open to uh, taking on, I mean, I, I, one of the things my agent said to me actually, when, when I said to him, Oh, well, you know, in in 2012, nobody was interested in this. And he, he said to me, Oh, well, what I have been told by publishers is find me young female historians because we, we want, we want more feminist history. And that's interesting in itself because um, just just last night the the Women's Prize announced their nonfiction long list, and this is the first year that the Women's Prize has done a nonfiction prize as well as a fiction prize. And one yeah. of the reasons, or the, I guess the main reason behind this prize being started up, is that women have not been getting uh, recognition for their nonfiction of, of any kind. I mean, women women do struggle to to or have in that having over many years struggled to be recognized for big literary prizes fiction and non-fiction and that does seem to have changed in the last few years because that thing prizes like the the samuel johnson prize and the bailey gifford prize and other other sort of history prizes are starting to include more women's history and uh that's great obviously because women actually buy more books than men and you wouldn't know it from go. I mean, I don't know how it is in American bookshops, but in British bookshops, if you go into the history section, loads of stuff on World War One and World War Two, and they're all these sort of grey, you know, like grainy photograph you know, man books. You know, um, books about books about Hitler and and books about you know prime ministers and presidents and soldiers and you know the band of brothers type stuff of all the you know the plucky plucky fighters that went off and and did the sort of amazing things. And if you're looking for women's books, it's like, well, where are they? And like, oh, it's the Six Wives of Henry VIII. They they are the historical um, women of significance. And and so I think I hope that that is starting to change, and that bookshops are starting to give more space to a, a different sort of history. And I mean, obviously, all the, all the things that I'm saying um, about you know, women's history, uh, people of color have been saying for years about. Um, you know, diverse history and 
again in the last few years we've we've started to see um a bit of a a bit of a a willingness to to tell different stories and to give those stories space so hopefully it is going to well continue and be- become embedded become the norm rather than just the the sort of yeah okay you can you can have your your little table over here rather than you know we'll put you in the in the main sort of shelving area this all leads me to believe too i mean i I just want to ask do you think that i mean i know that i don't know how things are in europe i would say that academia in the united states is in a little bit trouble um but at the same time i'm very interested in like sort of the rise of more diverse pop history and also, you know, when you're doing something like reception studies, it's a lot more interaction, I think, between academics and just regular people who are doing YouTube walkthrough or making a disgusting troll comment on Reddit. <laughs> or, uh, you know, I feel like there's a lot more cross contact, both in terms of the of who your research is looking at for, you know, things to talk about, and then maybe also who your research is for. Um, what has your work with gaming and, you know, writing something like Cleopatra's Daughter changed about who your audience is for your work? Hmm. Well, um, British academia is, is struggling in much the same ways as American academia, and it's entirely down to the, uh, the Westminster government's terrible, terrible financial mismanagement of the country's economy over... Uh, many years now, um, universities are being starved of of money, um, and so they are looking for ways that they can cut costs. And one of the things that they do is they they close down academic departments. There's there's this perception that the um, the humanities, the arts and the humanities, are not necessary because they don't make as much money as STEM, which is entirely untrue. Um, Britain's arts uh, and humanities. Well, I mean, they, they, we've just been talking about video games you know, and how much money video games make. So, so it is really, it is really some sort of baffling creative accounting that's, that's going on to, to say that arts and humanities um, are not, um, people are not interested in them because people are, people are really interested in them. And, and I think it is a good thing that, that people are that they're so interested in in the arts and humanities and in history and archaeology and things like that that they are doing their own work on them you know they they are they are reading the books themselves they are doing maybe they're doing short courses and things like that or maybe maybe they're just looking looking to things like you know um novels and films and video games um and they're they're sort of working on those and i i have had responses from people who have read my books, um, who have heard me on the radio, who have heard me on a podcast. I mean, it's it's not as many as I would like, to be honest. I mean, I it's it seems to be, I don't know, people don't tend to get in touch. You know, they they maybe hear someone on the radio um, and they might um, contact them and say, oh, I, I, heard, I heard what you're saying. I thought it was really interesting. I, you know, um, but that's, that's happened a few times. Um, people have... Um, email me about my book to say I've had I've had a couple of people email me to say that they have really enjoyed it um I've had a couple of sort of historical questions and I have had one um email actually just the other day um that noticed a mistake and wanted to tell me about it and I'm like, thank you I I will um I'm gonna I'm gonna try and address that for future future editions but I well that's that's literally like that, that's less than 10 people who I think have ever contacted me and so I'm like I hope that more than 10 people have read my work <laughs> um, because you know I, I would love I would love to hear from people who do um and then you know uh, I would I would because you know you you do you do your work partly for you partly out of your own personal satisfaction but you also do do it for other people because you you want to I mean I, I'm I'm an ancient historian I'm I am never going to be you know I'm, I'm not going to be making the kind of contribution to someone's life that a medical researcher who discovers you know a how to stop cancer is, is going to make but I do like to think that maybe I can make someone's day a little bit better <laughs> and I'd like to hear from them if I do that because yeah I mean that the it's yeah I, I I don't think you should you should I don't understand people academics who don't want to engage with other people don't want to engage with the general public 
Um, I, I can understand wanting to be very selective about when and how you do it, but I, yeah, I, I would, I would like, I would like to think that um, my my video gaming work is, if if people are reading it, people who love games and are reading it, and it makes them think about things that they'd never thought about. They played the games for fun, but you know, they'd never really thought about them beyond that. And if they can read the work and then they can start thinking about video games a bit more critically. And if it makes them think about, you know, oh, I, I never, I never thought that I could look at video games from an academic. Sorry, the sun is is kind of really <laughs> coming through the window, and then my I'm, so my my face must look very odd now on the camera. Um, so if if it makes people think that they can look at video games critically and they can ask for more from their video games, you know, I mean, obviously, yes, entertainment, great, but if they can ask for a better depiction of women, a better depiction of minorities, better depiction of history, because it's not historically accurate doesn't have to mean boring. There's so much crazy stuff in, in history that, that would be both amazing and hilarious to for, for someone to adapt. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, having a historically accurate video game does not automatically mean it's a boring one that all the fun has been sucked out of. Um, you know, there are plenty of incredibly historically inaccurate games that are really boring simply because the people who who made them were just not that great. <laughs> <laughs> so um, actually, this this plea for engagement is a perfect spot to end our hour with a couple of just very soft questions. One, what have you been playing recently that brings you joy? I have been playing Cult of the Lamb on my Nintendo Switch. Oh, that's a fun one. <laughs> Yes, I um prior to prior to that I was playing Witchwood and I loved that. That that might actually be um n n sort of edging out Skyrim and Oblivion as as uh you know up, up there with my favorite games. Oh, you like crafting? I love crafting. <laughs> I, I might, this 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 is the thing I I could I could happily just play a game where they were just like crafting stuff and the funny <laughs> thing about that is is that I never played you know the sims or second life or anything like that because I, I came to gaming quite late so so potentially yeah I I, I um I could I would have I would have been I would have loved those games I, I did play Farmville when that was on Facebook and and there was something very um very soothing about you know and, and Animal Crossing also I, that that was that was why I got the Nintendo Switch in the first place in lockdown <clears throat> was to play Animal Crossing. And uh, there is something very soothing about that kind of repetitive uh, activity. And that's, that's partly, I suppose, why I'm enjoying Cult of the Lamb, although the repetitive activity there is a, a wee bit darker than, than just uh, <laughs> tending your farm. Although you are kind of, you're tending your cult, but yeah. Yes. You know, you just got to tend your cult sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, given that you've mentioned an interest in hearing from people, where can you be found online? I am on the hellscape that is Twitter. Um, I am at JL Draycott. And, you know, one of the things that Twitter used to be good for was actually talking to people and getting into discussions and finding out new and interesting stuff. And it's so boring now. There is, there is, I don't know if it's because all the interesting people left or, you know, the algorithm is constantly just throwing like white supremacy and advertising in your face. But I do not get very, very much contact on Twitter anymore. I do not get very much engagement. There is, I do not come across interesting people saying interesting things anymore. So may, maybe it's dangerous to, to open the floodgates and say, contact me on Twitter. <laughs> but, you know, who, who could say? I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram um, as well. I have a, a website that I should update more than I do. And I don't, I don't know how easy it is to find online, to be perfectly honest. I'll put um, it in the yeah and i have my university website and you know all my sort of official university of glasgow stuff as well so i am i am present online i am visible and findable there is another jane draycott uh, she is a poet and we are constantly getting um mistaken for each other she gets my um people wanting me and i get people wanting her um so so uh yeah, but, but we we are two very different people with very different appearances and CVs. So I think if you if you you know you Google Jane Drake, you'll, you'll hopefully realize which one you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic! Uh, so I will put all that in the show notes for people who want to contact you. And Jane, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a really cool conversation. I'm so looking forward to whatever you're up to next. 
Well, thank you for, for asking me and, and listening to my ramblings for the for the last hour. I mean, this is this is one of the things about being um, an academic and being a sort of lecturer is that you get you get paid you, you know your your wages to sort of stand in a room and talk at people. Um, you do you do other stuff as well, but but the sort of the most the most obvious thing that you get to do is, is you you talk at people, i.e., students. And so it kind of can be a bit difficult to stop. Actually, <laughs> like you just my my partner says to me constantly, you know, you're you're you know you're lecturing me. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> well, uh, for well, this sometimes, hour, sometimes I mean to. But I mean, not all the time. <laughs> well, for this hour, it was very very welcome. And uh, for those of you who are out there uh, listening, watching, please like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming.